Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're delighted to welcome Francesca Royster in conversation with Alexis Pauline Gums for a discussion of Choosing Family, a memoir of queer motherhood and black resistance. It's a brilliant literary memoir of chosen family and chosen heritage told against the backdrop of Chicago's North and South sides. But first, to introduce both of these folks more warmly, um, Candace J. Merritt is a PhD candidate in the Department of African American Studies at Northwestern University. She holds an MA in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies from Georgia State University and a BA in Women's Studies from Emory University. Her dissertation project, In Search of Our Mother's Freedom, Examining the Felt Life of Black Motherhood, centers Black women's disavowals of motherhood in the late 20th and 21st centuries and theorizes its implications for Black feminist theories of mothering and reproductive freedom. You can find her most recent published essay, Trapped in the Political Real, Imagining Black Motherhood Beyond Pathology and Protest in the New Feminist Literary Studies, which is from Oxford University Press in 2020. And I asked Candace to kick this off for us because um, she is, is a fan, of course, and also um, just the one to do this. So Candace also is a bookseller at Karis Books and More. So there is no one better to welcome these folks in the room tonight. So welcome, Candace. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, ER. And I'm, yes, a bookseller, but also a book buyer, probably more so from Karis and the bookseller. Um, I have the pleasure and privilege to introduce our speakers this evening. Um, Francesca Royster is a native of Chicago, Southside, and a professor of English literature at DePaul University in Chicago, where she teaches classes on African-American literature and culture, Shakespeare, and gender and queer theory. She is the author of three academic books, Becoming Cleopatra, The Shifting Image of an Icon, Sounding Like a No-No, Queer Sounds in a Citric Act in the Post-Soul Era, and Black Country Music, Listening for Revolutions. She received her PhD in English Literature from the University of California, Berkeley. Her essays have appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Chicago Literati, and Feminist Studies, among others. She lives in Chicago, where shockingly, it feels just as cold there as it does here <laughs> in Atlanta. Uh, Alexis Pauline Gums is a poet, independent scholar, and activist. She is the co-author of Revolutionary Mothering, Love on the Front Lines, and author of Spill, Scenes of Black Feminist Fugitivity, M Archive, After the End of the World, Dub, Finding Ceremony, and Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. Please welcome our speakers this evening and thank you so much for being here. Okay. Thanks everybody and for being here. Oh, such wonderful, wonderful people in the audience, including Alexis. Thank you so much for being here. Um, your, your writing and just your presence always feeds me. So I so appreciate it. And hi to Annie and Cece if you're out there and all the great friends. Okay, and my pop, okay. All right, um, I'm going to just read a, a little bit, um, some from the preface of the book and then a little bit um, from uh, the middle. Okay. <clears throat> the Friday we began to think of ourselves as mothers started with a series of signs and wonders. A Banksy style painting of a child lifted by a red balloon stenciled on the wall of a downtown construction site as we walked from the L. A toddler in a spring green knit cap who popped his head over the back of our yellow booth at our favorite breakfast place waving at us shyly. Chicago Aprils could give you anything, rain, hail, fog, snow, but the day was miraculously warm with a steady sun. I had an important meeting that morning with the promotion committee at my university to consider my application for full professor, and my partner Annie had come to hold my hand. Despite the years of hard work and preparation for that day, teaching, researching, and writing books and articles, volunteering for hours of committee work, my mind was preoccupied with what I hoped would be a much bigger milestone. Four months previously, Annie and I had turned in our photo book so that birth parents could consider us to become adoptive mothers. In that photo book, we tried our best to represent our strengths. Two seasoned older women, one black, one white, who loved each other and wanted to raise a child and to bring that child into a community of family and friends, our chosen family. 
We tried to present ourselves as we are, caring and goofy. We wore our hearts on our sleeves. Somehow we hoped the book would communicate our passion to become mothers. Then three weeks before my meeting, we got a nibble. Our social worker, Wendy, showed us a photograph of a beautiful baby girl who had just been born, her face mostly cheeks and shining eyes. Her birth mother was considering us among others. At a giddy breakfast brainstorming session, Annie and I gazed at the photo and came up with the name Cecilia, if we were chosen. At first, I really pushed for the name Jessie. No one would mess with Jessie. I pictured her leaning against a brick wall, thumbs in the loops of her jeans. But in the end, it had to be Cecilia, graceful, ringing, and true. Before my promotion meeting was scheduled to start, we quickly ducked into Walgreens for last touches. A bottle of water, lip gloss, and breath mints. Standing in line, we heard Simon and Garfunkel singing, Cecilia, you're breaking my heart, playing on the loudspeakers. This has to be a sign. We're going to hear something about the baby for sure, Annie called out, doing a little dance. This is a story about losses as well as miraculous gains. This is a story about beginning motherhood in the second half of our lives. So it's about sore backs and knees, about making mistakes when we thought we should know better, and about the unspoken worry that we might not live to see our grandchildren. But it's also a story of second chances and rebirths. This is a story set in Chicago in the first decades of the 21st century. So it reflects the gentrification, racism, continued homophobia, and transphobia taking place in that city. But it's also about making sense and about creating home right where we're planted. This is a story about building a chosen family, which means trusting friends to love you like family. This is a story about queerness. And because of that, it's about yearning for the world that we want to have, but don't yet. Well, we must have convinced someone because our daughter came home to us. On a drizzly gray day in May of 2012, we drove the two miles from Rogers Park to Evanston to pick her up from the cradle nursery and to take her home. Our tiny Honda packed tight with the car seat firmly fitted by an officer Diaz, who warned us that from that time on, our own leg room would be irrelevant. We videotaped ourselves on the drive so that someday our child could see that day and witness our magical transformation from free women unencumbered to parents. As I watch that video now, it's clear to me that the transition had already happened. You can see it on our faces. We share the same wide-eyed, joyous, stunned look, like we'd just been lifted by a sudden, unexpected wind. Neither, neither of us could keep from smiling. Before we could take our daughter home, though, we had to give her one last meal at the cradle nursery. The blue and white bottles of baby formula donated by some hospital were weird and squat and medicinal looking, but she sucked them down anyway, emptying three of the bottles in one feeding. She had already grown since we first met her and was too big for the terry cloth pajamas from the cradle that she wore. We had gotten better at holding her over the past few weeks, more confident, but we still had to focus ourselves single-mindedly on the task. Annie giggled as the baby inched her way up past her chest to rest her head on her shoulders to burp. My hands shook as I gently folded our daughter's legs into the new yellow striped duck footed pajamas that we brought with us, one of the many things we purchased on faith that this would all happen. It had been hard, but there we were making a future together in the face of loss. Her birth mother had given her the name Angela, a name that is both beatif beatic, beatific and that of a fighter, both graceful and original. Angela with two L's. Angela with one, two fists upraised. And we chose Cecilia for her first name. Cecilia, patron saint of the healing power of music and of breaking and broken hearts. Cecilia, whose name echoes for me, Lucille, who we called Celie, my New Orleans born great grandmother who so enjoyed music and doting on those she loved. Celie, whose pork chops with red eyed gravy healed the sick, or at least the homesick. 
Sealy of stylish shoes and weekly beauty shop appointments and a deep dimpled smile. Sealy of healing hands that smelled, now I know, of lemon balm. Honoring the past, we named her Cecilia Angela, but honoring who she was right then, small, beautiful, quick, we called her Cece. We heard a ringing voice announcing that Cecilia was going home over the intercom, followed by a bell summoning us all to the sitting room. Annie and I carried Cece in her car seat, so unbelievably heavy. As we entered, we saw another family leaving, one that we recognized from our parenting classes, a cherubic blonde couple wearing the same jubilant smile we had, carrying their little brown baby boy, whom they dressed in a blue and white onesie and a soft cubs hat. We snatched the couple awkwardly, we, I'm sorry, we watched the couple awkwardly, that would be different. We watched the couple awkwardly and laughingly maneuver the car seat out of the front door and into the unknown. Congratulations, we called out to them. Good luck, they called back. And then it was our turn. Our social worker, Wendy, ushered us to sit on the overstuffed striped couch as the ceremony began. Women of different colors and sizes and ages circled us, peering into Cece's car seat. Some, including Wendy, had tears in their eyes. They were the volunteer huggers, the nurses, the social workers, the administrators, and the fundraisers. In short, everyone who had worked on the process. We posed for photos, shook some hands, and got some hugs. Then they waved goodbye to us as we too walked out the front door and into the unknown. Our joy, the fit of our particular child in our arms, and the sense of the rightness of our choice to become mothers so late in our lives together, despite our questions and struggles, felt both faded and intentional, a sign of a fierce love within us and beyond our powers. I understood more than ever that adoption is both a coming together and a rupture, a separation from one family to another. But still, there must have been some kind of magic at work in the relationships that brought us all together. Those included the folks at the cradle and our own families, blood and chosen, who listened and encouraged us gave us bags and bags of gently used clothes, helped us to buy the right car seat and maneuver the mini belts and buttons to install it. There was magic too in Cece's birth mother's decision and her choosing us for reasons that we will never fully know. Magic and her birth mother's own logic, connections we didn't fully understand and a kind of grace, be it fate, karma, or the hands of the ancestors. Led, to, led us to this moment. In addition to any of the otherworldly forces that may have been at play, I hold fast to the idea that we have a kind of responsibility to create community with the people around us and they to us, even as we navigate the different and often difficult social forces that bring us together in the same room. Those are bonds that don't have to be of blood or region or profession, but of what we do in the world a shared fight. With our coming together, there's a refusal that the world is in free fall, that our connections, however they begin, have had an impact on the world. Cece's very life, her vitality, and the decision that she come home to us to be our child are a reflection of that community. Annie says that when she sees Cece, she sees a new dream of motherhood, the possibility of being a different kind of mother a motherhood shaped by intention and a life lived resisting history. When I look into Cece's eyes, I find traces of my own lost family and self. To me, she's the embodiment of all there is in my own family story that has been lost or purposefully erased. Not just the way that her eyebrow lifts mischievously the way my mother's did, or the way that her nose, round and shiny in the middle like my own, makes me always want to tweak it but in her deep brown, sun-kissed African face. I write this knowing that Cece may have to fight not to hear her own story only as one of loss, the loss of a birth mother whom we know only through occasional emails, the loss of a father whose story is still cloudy to us, brothers, sisters, cousins, and grands lost. Hers is also a story of gains and unexpected twists of connection, the gaining of double mothers 
and home and a chosen family waiting breathlessly for her arrival. The gain of a future community of others who have been adopted like she has been, or who have been raised by same sex or interracial parents, who are other black girls born and raised in this troubled but also beautiful century. Ah, so beautiful and definitely echoing what Lauren shared in the chat. Your words on the page are such magic, but hearing you share that moment and those words is phenomenal generosity. So uh -huh. I'm just going to take a breath. I think probably everybody listening might need that breath too, just to take in what a gift it is for you to share this with us. Thank you, Alexis. <sighs> Thank you. So and we're feeling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. We are yeah. feeling it in this moment, but I just wanted to give some space for you to say, and you, you share some of this in the book itself about why you wanted to write this particular book. And it may be that there even are more insights about what's at stake for you in sharing, sharing your story, in this <laughs> form, you know, as you have begun to share it right now. But yeah, would you like to share how you came to to know that this was that you wanted to engage the generosity and the rigor of sharing your story in this form with all of us? Thank you. Well, um, yeah, that's a great question. And you know, some of the reason is very selfish because um, I find such everyday beauty in this experience of being a mother that I just want to slow it down and have some space to think about it. And um, the experience of motherhood is so fast and kind of requires so much attention <laughs> that, you know, sometimes just making that space of reflection has been really necessary. Um, and since uh, Annie and I first got together 24 years ago, we had been saying every year that we were gonna make a scrapbook of our lives together. And every time we're, we're, we've been too busy to do it. So writing the book has been that. And it also has been a way to connect um, to um, past generations of mothers and, and fathers, to um, family, um, to really give testimony to a truth that I feel, which is that the very ways that um, our family, you know, as African Americans, are often figured as excessive, as outlaw, as out of bounds, as shameful, are also some of the ways that we survive and make connection, and that are that's sustaining in a world that's violent. So I felt a kind of urgency to link the ways that Annie and I are trying to think about motherhood and as a way that has fluid boundaries in terms of who gets to be in, in the community and who gets to be part of the family as part of a, a history of, um, of queer family and um, really like um, making a way out of no way, but, but um, more than that, more than, more than just struggle, also the joy of connecting with other people. And, um, and I think that that joy is a story that needs to be told and retold and kind of recentered, especially right now, you know, in such a, a difficult time. Um, so I wrote it also, yeah, to kind of change the story to feed other people who might see themselves in that story and also, you know, just to heal myself as well, uh, because that um, some of those like negative messages and ideas and constraints are, um, you know, just just dampen the soul. And so part of my reason for writing this too is to just create breathing room and create healing as well. Mm. Well, you did, you did. It's such a nourishing memoir to read and I love so many things about it, but one of the things that I love, and it, it speaks to the, the intervention that you're also making, is that the way you tell 
this story of family, this story of choosing motherhood is it it pushes back against the idea of isolation of nuclear family as isolation of um, parenting as isolating in this society in the very form of how you write this book, right? So this mm -hmm. book is clear the entire time that the story of becoming Cece's mothers is also the story of your love story with Annie, your family history, relationship with your mother. There's just so much that you offer here. And I think that's why the word generous keeps keeps coming back, you know, because you could have just been like, this is our adoption story. And that would be a huge contribution, you know, and we need that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we would all be like, hooray. But you <laughs> definitely didn't stop there. You were like, here is my love. Here is how I arrived at this place in my love. Here <laughs> are my people. Here is my shifting relationship of what it means to be of this set of people. And I just want to thank you again for your generosity because it makes all it makes all the difference. It really allows the reader to, this reader for sure, but I think the reader in general, to find themselves in the story, right? To ask themselves, I ask myself questions about how do I understand who I am in partnership? How do I understand who I am in lineage? How do I understand how I care and nurture and with intention, you know, as, as you mm -hmm. say, and so if there's anything that you want to say about that, about that decision to tell this story in that way, or about what you found through that act of expansive reflection that mm -hmm. took you took you back before you were born into your own family mm -hmm. history and also back through, you know, these 24 years of partnership. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, part of the the ways that I was I was writing like even my own writing style. Um, like whenever I would tell a story or think of an event, you know, early in Cece's life, um, and the book goes up to when she's about six, um, those stories were just re reverberating for me with my own childhood, but also, you know, these images and pictures and places. And I almost, um, yeah, I almost just felt like the presence of all these mothers and people when I would try to make decisions together with Annie. Like I felt like there were all these voices with me kind of helping me forget to helping me to figure out what to do next um, when we would run into crisis or, you know, just try to figure out how to help encourage CC to become, you know, the person that she's meant to be. But I also think that like together with these, these folks who aren't, aren't with me every day. I'm also surrounded by these loving, wise friends and um, and my blood family who I'm very close to. Um, this is birthday season. Um, like every like every other week we have a birthday right now. So um, in my blood family. So I just feel like, you know, this is a, um, I think I chose to write the book also really, evoking the people around me who were modeling how to be nurturing or, you know, just how to take care of a little one or um, how to balance your life. And, um, and so I, I feel um, also, I, I feel just lucky to have like people alive around my table who are also helping me, helping to shape our story and, and like helping me model for CC another way of, of being family. So I'm, you know, just so much gratitude. Oh. And some of them are here. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> All the love and gratitude. Mm. Mm. Well, one more thing I was curious about before we give some space, if, if other folks have questions, is that, I mean, you're in this moment, you have two books pretty close coming into the world, right? So you have the Black Country Music book and you have this book. 
and you're everywhere. <laughs> you know, you're doing it, doing all the things. I'll be like, wait, were you in Durham? It's like, you know, it's like a gust of, of like beautiful, colorful wind. And it's like, that was France. Francesca just moved through town. Um, and I just wanted to ask about, I mean, because I know that it, well, to me, having read both books and, and heard you talk about them both a little bit now, it does feel like the reflection, the turning back, um, the expansiveness of mothering is something that shows up in both of these texts and, you know, reclamation and the memoiristic impulse seem to show up in both. But if you would like to say something about what you have noticed about yourself or about your ways or yourself in community as a person sharing by sharing these aspects of your life so close to each other in time. I would love to hear anything you want to say about that. Oh, thank you, Alexis. Yeah, I really, I do feel like um, the books fed, fed one another. And as I was writing them, you know, sometimes I would um, just switch back and forth to kind of keep my brain fresh. Mm -hmm. um, and the process of writing a memoir was was really challenging for me because I consider myself, I, I'm sure it's challenging for anyone, but I'm like often a very private person. And sometimes I don't even know <laughs> what what is going on inside, you know? So it takes, you know, it took a lot of pushing of myself to put myself out there. And when I was writing the country music book, I also used memoir but the music itself, and in some ways, the artistry of the wonderful people that I was writing about, let me be kind of a second voice. Um, so it it was hard in some ways to be kind of the eye of another book. But I also think that in both books, I um, and really all the all the things I've written, I'm really interested in the things that like the spirit of survival and the imagination, especially as a place of um, thriving and a lens for seeing the world. And I'm really interested in people who I, I feel like are underestimated or um, who could be crushed by something that's happened in their lives or with just the burdens of the historic moment that they're in but who manage extraordinary, extraordinariness and artfulness and creativity. And I definitely see that in, um, you know, in my, in the parents and ancestors that I evoke in the book. And I also see it in the musicians that I was listening to. And so much so that listening to them and trying to really feel, listening to the country music um, artists and trying to feel the the risks that they were taking would would push me to take more risks and to be more vulnerable in what I'm doing. And I know that um, you know I'm never going to be a musician like in a famous way because I am pretty bad. But but I do think that like words can be a place for me to um, to offer something that's genuine. Um, and so that was one way that writing the country book and listening to that to the soulful music of like Our Native Daughters or Valerie June or some of my other favorites um, was feeding just the process of digging deep and going to, into the space of memory sometimes, even when it was hard. Um, so yeah, I've learned that I, I like to, I'm always interested in these like eccentric stories basically. And I, I like to move back and forth between um, kind of analysis and then per the personal and spiritual, and that sometimes I need to pivot back and forth to get myself to go further. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I, th I think now that I'm, um, well, once my book, book travels and book work, public publicity work is, is, has calmed down a little bit, I actually have two book ideas in, in process. And I, I actually think I'm gonna to continue to try to, to write two books at a time. <laughs> it's just, uh, it makes me feel like there's like this generous world of ideas and that I can also have different modes and different selves and 
if I'm feeling weary, I can switch and go to something else. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that idea. I love the idea of the, the different books as supportive partners to each other and mm -hmm. that the pivoting can actually support you to go further in to each project. I love that. And I think and that there's precedent for that. You know, I know the writer Miriam Chauncey often writes two books at the same time. And Really? Um, that's cool. Yeah. Elizabeth Wheeler has this great question that's I think also related about the growth of your memoir voice as somebody mm -hmm. who, you know, has earlier written multiple academic books that also that also have your voice. And um, is there anything that you want to say about the growth of that memoir voice at this stage? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy, for that question. Um, I, I definitely had to grow over the course of writing this book and to discover, um, I guess, to discover a way to not, I guess, like, I guess what I was saying a little bit before about the the pleasure of analyzing something that's kind of more abstract and distanced. I had to kind of learn how to um, go deep and to be willing to share it. Um, and so that was part of my journey. Um, so there was kind of a psych psychic and psychological journey, which coincidentally does have to do with becoming a mother that also when you're a parent or you know any kind of important role in a young person's life, you have to be vulnerable and be willing to get things wrong and things like that. So um, speak up, all those things. So that is definitely important. I also um, take a million classes. I haven't in a while, but I took a, a wonderful um, workshop that was called Memoir in a Year that was sponsored by Story Studio Chicago. Mm -hmm. And um, that helped a lot. I already had, um, a collection of what I thought of as essays, but I really wanted to learn how to make it into an arc, a story with an arc, and to learn how to develop an I, like myself as a character, and not just me experiencing things. So um, that class really helped me a lot um, to kind of have a more controlled storytelling technique and to develop my voice. And then I also just read really, uh, amazing i try to read a lot and i read poetry and you know cultural criticism and i listen to music and um i read people like alexis too <laughs> just to see all the different ways that you can really use language to talk about things and that um you know it's very freeing to know that um you know writing a memoir there's there there are no blueprints exactly. I mean, there are there are rules, but there are rules to be broken. And someone like, you know, Audre Lorde Zami is a, is a terrific example of that, where she's writing poetry and she's talking about history and she's, you know, thinking about her young self and her relationship to her mother. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm I'm growing as a writer to know that I can I can really draw on all these different kinds of writers for whatever I I plan to write next. Mm, I love that. I love that. And thinking about mother daughter relationships and younger selves, I have this. Okay, so y'all keep putting questions. Don't mm -hmm. stop putting questions because we're so captivating. We are, but still mm -hmm. put questions. Um, I was thinking about, I was like, what kind of imagination activity could we do? <laughs> and I, I know you've thought about like, what will Cece think about this book, you know, as she reads it as she becomes a <coughs> older reader, um, as she experiences different parts of her own life and, and looks back. And this mm -hmm. is such a beautiful record and archive to have and portal, you know, to have, to travel. But if you could imagine, if you could imagine, and you, you address it, you do address it a little bit in the work itself, but if you could share with us and maybe even continue imagining what your wishes are for how this work can support CC in her life. Let's say, let's say 20 years from now. So when oh. she's 
yeah. in her thirties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, I love that. I mean, thinking about the portal, the CC portal, the time portal. Yeah. Um, I hope that this is a book that she um, can hold and just think about, you know, just as evidence of just the deep love that she belongs to, like the world that she belongs to is one where she's so deeply loved and that um, there are all these people who, who've known her and met her and also people that she doesn't know who are behind her and with her and around her. So that in a very basic way is what I hope um, that she'll get just this feeling of connection and belonging um, you know, um, you know, beyond mortality and all those other limits that sometimes scare us. And, um, and I also hope that, um, she'll see in it, I guess the, the work, like the work as like an example of how you can take something that seems to be an individual act and really connected to other people. So I hope that it will serve, you know, also as an example of how whatever you put in the world, whether it's a book or um, a dance or a cool hairstyle or whatever it is, <laughs> that it it's reverberating with people and it becomes part of a bigger conversation. And that, you know, in my in my belief, that's really why we're here on the earth is to um, connect and to inspire each other. And so um, seeing how one person, one limited person is able to try to attempt that, I think, I hope will be inspiring for her. And yeah, also, you know, as a, as a history, like thinking about an example of how you can attempt to find stories that you want to know that aren't, where the answers aren't really there. And maybe the answers are not written down and that, um, cause I know she's, she's someone now who's, who wants to know the answers um, to history and to connect to history. So those are some of the things. I know that she's going to be a person who is, she's a big people person and she's also, um, you know, a very creative person and she'll figure out her, her way to be part of the world of, of creative creative connection and, and communication. So um, I gave her her own copy of the book. She might actually be watching, I'm not sure, because I, I have the door closed, but um, but she was at the the first reading in at Women and Children First last week. Um, so yeah, I just want her to kind of see it as something that she can um, lean on and and maybe get inspiration from but just also just as, as evidence of all these people who care about her so mm. i love that yes evidence <laughs> love evidence to tap love into. evidence yeah <laughs> that's so beautiful Aww. all right y'all do you have any more questions any more questions? I think it's like a sign that everybody listening is really getting what they need. <laughs> They're really <laughs> getting what they need from everything that you're saying. And it's meeting them exactly in their lives where they are open to what it means, what it means to work in a multi-generational way, an interconnected way, mm -hmm. the reverberation right, that you just talked about is happening. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, I, I always have more questions, but is, yeah, is there something that you want to add? Oh, I just wanted to say how, um, again, I'm not just saying this because you're here in the room and on the screen, but your, your concept of revolutionary mothering and mothers and others is so important to me and um, was really like in my mind um, as I was writing and um, like, I just want to read a quote that I have from you that I use as the um, epitaph, I guess. Um, you write in Mother Others, or Mother Other Ourselves, a Black queer feminist genealogy for radical mothering. 
It is an act of love to participate in the resistance work of child raising. Um, one of the things I really admire about that is that your language of mothering here can be about like that child raising doesn't have to be a mother in the traditional sense. And it just recognizes all these different ways that we can mother and, and be like make a difference um, for a young person and for the next generation. So I really just love that. And I love the expansiveness of how you are thinking about mothering in your work. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much yeah. for that. And thank you also, um, Candace, for this question that's here, speaking of people who have expansive theories of mothering. So Candace has this beautiful question. What drew you to the language of choice? in framing your memoir? And how might that challenge popular ways of understanding women and girls' relationship to mothering? Thinking of how mm. people consider women and girls as, this is in scare quotes, natural caregivers and mothers and how people in and outside families task women and girls with the labor of mothering. Mm, that's such a great question. Wow. So yeah, the yeah. Language, language of choice. That's great. Yeah, okay, I have two two ways into that. But the first is just to think about, yeah, what you're saying that to be intentional about mothering and to live a, a full life before becoming a mother um, was, um, was a kind of choice in that, um, you know, it was kind of deliberate. It, it also had to do with, you know, feeling, finding a partner who I wanted to raise a child with, and that it took me a little while to do that. <laughs> so, um, but I think that like that idea of intentionality and choice um, was really important for us, even as we we're thinking about how we would go through, how we would we'd adopt, um, and you know, choosing open adoption in order to give at least some choice to. Um, to Cece's birth family and birth mother in particular. So we were like recognizing also that, you know, our privilege means that the choices that we have and the choices of Cece's birth family are gonna be different, um, but, um, but still really trying to um, just recognize the agency of, um, of all of us, I guess, in this decision. And um, I think was really important. And, you know, it's also one that goes against the grain of, you know, as you say, like kind of sexist ideas about women and girls and what's natural, like it's natural to be a mother. Um, and it, it also goes against like um, stereotypes about black folks and sexuality and um, control and all these other things like that. So um, not at all, I mean it kind of in a way that's kind of the opposite of respectability politics, um, but I think um, but I think it can be a way of, of kind of freeing us from some of those um, constraints uh, that are really kind of white white centric constraints about the right time and the right um, right things, the right relationships that you need to become a mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I hope you see all this beautiful acknowledgement in the chat. Um, Janica Lewis has this great question. Janica, that's my home girl for many, like 20 years, more than 20 years. Wow. Um, is, is following up on Candace's question, asking about how do you mother yourself, mother yourselves differently as you mother others? Such a great question. Wow, yeah. Hmm. Um, is that is that one for both of us? Because I think that- Oh, should. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, let's see, how do we mother ourselves? I feel like, um, I think that really like having this um, very alive, very unpredictably brilliant 
young person, <laughs> you know, in my life every day means that um, I'm fed in a way that's really different than, you know, than before I became a mother. Um, when I was very good at like buying myself presents or, uh, which I still do, or uh, treating myself well, or going on vacation. Like, I think that there's a kind of beauty and pleasure to our everyday life um, that just brings me joy. And that itself is a kind of like being in relationship to Cece and to Annie feeds me. So that's like, um, so building those relationships is one way that I mother myself. And I've also just tried to challenge and reflect on like the kind of critical versions of mothering, um, you know, like steering myself or um, like some of the, the voices of critique that I have in my head or voices of um, pressure and urgency. And so trying to replace those voices with just more kindness and more um, the same kind of kindness that I try to give to other people. I'm trying to do that more to myself. So that's definitely a process, <laughs> but some, some way that I think about that. Yeah. How about you, Alexis? Yeah, I love the question so much. I think that, you know, that, of course, I emphasize the other and mother and that that transformative impact of mothering, as you say, and I'm just in this moment thinking about the, it absolutely is an invitation to love myself deeper and more intentionally, and maybe even more um, in a bigger way, like more bigly, because <laughs> I was thinking about some of our, some of our loved ones who are babies who have been born out of our, our organizing chosen family. And mm -hmm. I remember this particular experience with Mimi, who is one of these babies, when I started to realize how she watched me. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I would put on my chapstick and she would like dig in her mom's purse and, and put something on her face. And I was like, oh yeah, that level of watching absolutely clarifies what is it that I want to exude, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I know that there is attentiveness that our, our loved ones who are around us in moments where we don't necessarily think, you know, I'm not saying words, so I'm not necessarily like, oh, this is me transmitting a message. I'm still actually transmitting a message all the time. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? How do I want to feel so that that can be exuded? What mm -hmm. are the practices I want to cultivate given that I don't know, you know, it's like this, it's like the sweetest surveillance, you know, ever <laughs> of um, that. Like, so it puts that like dance, like no one's watching cliche into a totally yes. different stake and release like, oh yeah, absolutely. There's a, what I would have wanted to see, what I feel like, she deserves to see around her mm -hmm. that is that becomes this loving mandate you know um, yeah that's one way for sure and yeah there i mean there are there are many i, I also think about the fact that the people who taught me to wake up early in the morning and write are both moms both black moms solo parenting at the time that they taught me that and just knowing how being available to myself in that way early in the day absolutely changes my availability to be able to care and to be in this process of transformative reciprocity generosity that that is really really important mm -hmm. so yeah it does make me think about nourishing myself, not just for that productivity of care, but for the availability to receive the transformation that happens in that care. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I really, I do really feel like there are that 
kids our own and the kids that we're connected to we're in relationship to are witnesses to something that maybe even we don't see as we're kind of living our days and so like our actions and our just our commitment to there being a, a future at all I think is really important yes. to those witnesses and um, yeah how we spend our time how we treat ourselves all that is really important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh what a great question I love that well I think we have time for one more question before we move into the wrapping up things is there a question that somebody didn't get a chance to ask yet? A curiosity you're holding? Hmm. Mm. Okay. Well, if, <coughs> I just wanted to then ask you, based on my curiosity, and you don't have to, I know your next project <coughs> is in process, but um, if you want to talk about as specifically or as vaguely as feels right, what what is in your mind and imagination right now what feels oh. like it's it's coming through next or what has been made possible in terms of your future writing by these projects that have come into the world just now oh yeah absolutely well bo both of the projects are really coming out of the two books in different ways and conversations that i've had that have made me realize like what's what's necessary to keep pursuing. So um, the one one project, which I think of as possibly one that's gonna take me a while is um, about the role of music um, as a form of grieving and healing for black women mm. in the diaspora. And I imagine it as, in the black diaspora, and I imagine it as a book that like shifts location. So the the first I know, and maybe the spine of it would be um, thinking about Brazil and Salvador, Brazil, which is where my mother passed away unexpectedly. Right. And also is just an amazing, such an amazing place of um, music and culture making and just the, the presence, the African presence there. So I am zeroing in on music that can help me talk about the story of that loss, but also mm -hmm. uh, planning a trip um, that I've been had to put off a few times because of the pandemic with the family to really kind of live a story. And I don't know what the story will be, but being in that space. Um, and I hope to, you know, also kind of talk about like um, the group EBA and in Paris or and mm -hmm. or um, um, Angelique Kijo's salute to Celia Cruz. And mm -hmm. I just have like actually a million examples, but I want to travel and write <laughs> and think about them. So that's yes. there, but <coughs> <coughs> the other one, <coughs> excuse me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have to call on Prince, help me Prince. Okay. Yes, Prince. <laughs> All right, ah, I'm better. Okay, um, but the other project um, came out of the Black Country Music book, and I realized one of the people who I just wrote about a little bit was this performer, Linda Martell, who's a Black female performer of country music at the end of the 60s, and who um, came out with one album that has influenced a lot of great um, Black women artists now. Um, but she just, um, she stepped away from the music industry and from um, the mainstream country music industry because of racism <laughs> <coughs> and her granddaughter. <coughs> I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Take, 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 take time. <coughs> She's still alive and her granddaughter has been collecting her stories and thinking about her. So mm -hmm. I wanted to write something that could be in support of that project, but also... <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, continuing the investigation of black country music performers and fans that I've started with the book. Um, so yeah, so I don't know what that'll look like either. I kind of have given up really knowing what yeah. <laughs> the end product is going to be, but um, but a music book 
that's personal and also a music book that's really focusing on someone who's <coughs> history, <coughs> whose history <coughs> demands, <coughs> <coughs> demands to be told sorry sorry yes no it's all good you did it we did it we did, we did it. it we did <laughs> it it's done so er if you would come back to tell us how everybody can get the book and support caris that would yes. be wonderful thank you thanks alexis um <laughs> yeah. thank you both so much um it's always a pleasure um and I want to let folks know you can click this teal button at the bottom center of the screen to buy Choosing Family, a memoir of queer motherhood and black resistance um, from Karis. It really does help us when you buy your event books from us. Uh, you can scroll scroll up through the chat to see um, if you missed Dr. Royster when she was at Karis for our event about black country music. Oh, here we go. <laughs> there, were, there were requests. Uh, you were missed. Uh, you can go back and watch that on our YouTube channel. That was a great conversation as well. So if you're like, oh, this is this is my first time knowing that you wrote another book, go go watch that conversation, which was wonderful. Um, you can also <laughs> scroll up and see uh, the link to Undrowned, Alexis's beautiful book, um, and so many others. So um, thank you both. I wish you both um, so much, so much uh, wellness and good things. And um, everybody watching tonight, thank you so much for being with us. We hope that you stay safe and well as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Good night, y'all. Good night, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you.